Hey! 
nothing entices us like Jesus. Because in his presence is freedom. All of our sin is forgiven. There's peace that outlasts darkness and hope that's in the blood. There's future grace that's mine today that Jesus Christ has won. So I can face tomorrow for tomorrow. Just like you always have, I'm fighting a battle. You've already won. Oh, thank you, Jesus. No matter what comes my way, I will overcome. Don't know what you're doing. No, what you've done. 
songs have a way of ministering to us and guiding us in his truth. Amen. How many feel like you're going through a battle right now and you don't know how to fight this thing? But remember, we just came off of a resurrection Sunday where Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. It is finished. Why? Because he did the work. He did it. We don't have to do it. In fact, we can't do it, my friends. We need Jesus Christ. We need, we need everything, his atonement of what he did on that cross for us. We need him. And so instead of relying on your own strength and your own intellect and your own power and your own money, why don't we just surrender it to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I'm going to put my hands and my life in your plan because you know what's right for me, amen? And sometimes that's not easy to do, but today we're going to declare that Jesus has done it on the cross and it is finished, amen? Because we know now how the story ends, right? It didn't end on the cross, it didn't end in the tomb, it ended with a resurrection Lord and Savior who's coming back again, amen? So let's live as children of God with that hope and not be disappointed and discouraged because he holds our life in his hands. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, I know how the story ends. We will be with you again. You're my Savior, my defense. No more fear in life or death. Hallelujah. Let's sing that again. Yes, I.
praise God this morning. Why don't you turn to your neighbor before you sit down, give him a high five and say, God is good. He's good all the time. Into another after worship. So before you meet and greet, we'll get to that part. But we're going to go ahead and transition into communion time. So I'm going to ask each and every one of you, go to the nearest station. Go ahead and grab those elements and take a seat. And we'll get started. something to share with you before we partake in communion. These past two weeks, I had the privilege and the opportunity to walk in ancient lands and ruins where Apostle Paul walked. And I was just amazed and touched by everything that I saw there. But the Lord spoke to me so deeply on a day there. And it was a message that related and connected to communion. So how could I not come back and share that with you all today? In these ruins that I went to, one of them being Ephesus, Paul walks there and he preaches the gospel message. In this place, this place in Ephesus, many worshipped, idolized gods who had so many different gods there. And yet Paul goes there and speaks about this unknown God that nobody knew about. And he preaches that to so many. And of course, there were the ones that didn't listen, didn't believe. But there were some in that crowd that did believe that day and followed them, followed him. There is another place in Corinth that, as we know, in Corinthians, I've mentioned this many times when we've done and we've partaken in communion how the Corinthians partook in, in communion, but they did it selfishly. They did it for themselves. They were dishonoring the Lord when they should have been doing it for others and for their relationship with the Lord. So there was just so much there that Paul spoke about. And what I noticed being in that, in that place is just the sense of division, division in these places. Everybody was divided there. Some believed this God and others believed that God. But nobody had, there was no balance there. There was no unity. And that's what, what, what Paul tried to preach. He tried to preach a message of unity, of hope, to be whole and complete. And that only comes through Jesus Christ. Amen? And so I wanted to bring that message to you today because communion is important today as it was many, many years ago. Yet, we can feel a bit divided sometimes when we are taking communion, right? If we reflect on it a little bit, as Paul tells us to reflect in 1 Corinthians 11, he tells us to examine our hearts. Just as he was telling the Corinthians there, you know, we can take that for ourselves too, that we should never forget the importance of communion, that the reason why we do it it's because we love the Lord. We understand the price that he paid for each and every one of us. And so when it, he says, examine your heart, it doesn't mean necessarily that you need to repent of your sins. Of course, that's part of it, right? It's a big part of it. But it also brings a message of unity. And how can we bring that? How can we bring that into our own lives? How can we personalize that message? Well, think about community. Right? Think about your home community, your families, your neighbors. Is there any division in there that needs to be whole again? Think about your work communities. 
your coworkers, your boss, your supervisors? Do you feel divided being in that environment? Do you feel hostile, hostile with anybody there? Are you partaking in anything that brings division? Are you a part of it? Or in your church community, right? <laughs> That's where we see some division, right? Sometimes we see gossip. We hear gossip. There's judgment, assumptions made sometimes that can cause a division. And there should be unity, especially in the church, right? And there could even be division within ourselves. The Bible speaks that there should be connection with our body, our mind, and our spirits, and our hearts. Sometimes there can be a division in that too. So I ask you today to reflect to think about anything that needs to be whole. Of course, you can't do it on your own, right? But we have somebody that we can go to, that we can cling to, that can help us, that can bring that unity, just as he used Paul to spread that message to the people that were divided amongst their community. So let's go ahead and bow our hearts and our minds, and let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we are so grateful for the opportunity opportunity, Lord, to partake in communion in this time that is so sacred, that means so much to you, Lord, that your son, Jesus, on the night before he was to be crucified, he chose to be with his community, his disciples, to teach of communion, Lord, of a time to remember you of a time to remember the price of the blood, Lord, and a body that was soon to be broken. It was a time to repent of any sins, Lord, of forgive anybody that we hadn't forgiven, Lord. And this time was so precious to Jesus, so this time should be just as precious to us, Lord. And in that night, there was unity before the betrayal Lord, before the doubts, there was unity, Lord. So we know that there is power, there is wholeness, there is hope in what we do. So Lord, we thank you for the time that we get to reflect, that we get to say, I'm sorry for the things that cause division. Lord, we pray for every single community that we may be a part of, Lord that needs unity, Lord. We pray that you are in the middle of those environments, Lord, that you can touch us, Lord, in a way that that speaks only your truth, Lord, to these places, Lord. Equip us, Father God, with your truth, with your light, with your hope and your love and your compassion, Lord, so we can spread the same message that Paul spread years and years and years ago, Lord. Lord, as I as we transition to move on to bless, Father, these elements, I hold in my hand bread. Lord, the representation of your body, a body that was broken, a body that was wounded, Lord, and bruised for our transgressions. Lord, your bread is all that we need. It is the daily bread, Father. In our physical bodies, Lord, we will always be hungry. We will always desire more of you, Lord. But there will be a time, Father, where we won't hunger or desire anymore. Why? Because we will be fulfilled and we will be with you, Lord. So, Lord, we bless this bread today. Thank you, Lord. You may take the bread. you and we thank you for the cup that we are now holding Lord as it represents your blood Father God that was spilled on Calvary Lord we thank you for how it just covers our sins it covers our sins but it also washes our sins away Lord we thank you that it washes it away that there's there's a clean slate in each and every one of us Lord that there's no cling, we don't have to cling, Father God, to the past. We don't have to cling to 
the guilt, the anger. Father God, we don't have to cling to the fear, the anxiety, the depression, anything that holds us down and bears a burden on us, Lord. We can release that, Lord, because of the price that your son, Jesus Christ, paid for everyone. Lord, thank you for your blood. Thank you for the covenant, Lord, that was established. Lord, that the new exceeded the old. You are the God that creates new things, Lord. You are a God that creates new things in each and every one of us, Lord. We thank you for the blood. You may take the cup. Church, you can go ahead and put these cups on the seat back pocket. I just felt, I just feel that God just encouraged some people this morning with that message as he has encouraged me. So I want you to take that today. Take that into your communities. Take that within yourself. Wherever you feel divided, spread a message of hope. Spread a message of unity. Okay, this life is short. This life is short. And we can't risk living any more days in division, in confusion, in distress. Okay? All right. And it starts right now, church, right? Now we can get into the meet and greet portion of today and start spreading that message of unity to one another. Start right now and carry that with you. Okay, church? All right. Let's go. Life groups Wednesdays. Don't miss out on that. There's still time. Yeah. Give it up for your life groups. We have one in Santa Clarita and one in Northridge. There's still time to sign up for those. If you want to sign up for one, you haven't come to one yet, come see myself or go see Michelle and Charles. We will be glad to get you the information and get you up to speed so you can join in for the last two weeks of this session. And then also this Thursday, so we have Wednesday life groups. Thursday, the youth group is having a work day cleaning day for all the youth rooms. Yeah. Because teenagers are messy, right? So we are going to do some deep cleaning. We're going to move some TVs around, do some painting, uh, take some, some old things that are a little broken, right? We'll take those down and throw those away. So if you are free, if you have a youth, uh, t- a teenager in the youth group, and you want to come and help us out, help us paint, help us do something, we are, we'll host you, we'll feed you, and then we'll put you to work, right? So don't miss out on it. We want to have you guys come out. Uh, it's from 630 to 830, our normal youth time, but we're just going to take that time to bond, to have some fun, play some music, uh, and we'll still pray. We'll still have a little Bible study, but we're going to take care of some business in those youth rooms. And then Friday, where's the men at? Oh, man, men. Here we go. Let's try this again. So we got Wednesday life groups, Thursday youth group, Fridays watchmen. Yeah. It was so deep you can't even hear it. That's what it was. We have Watchmen this Friday. We're going bowling and we're tailgating beforehand. If you want to go to that, please sign up today. Put your phone number there. Um, We want everyone to sign up if we can to get it today. Uh, That way, um, Coach can get it all settled for us and get it all ordered. We're going to be... We're going to be doing some stuff, uh, some tailgating in the parking lot. And then at 7 o'clock, we're going bowling. It's a good time. If you've never been to a Watchman, this is the one to come to. It's super cool and relaxed. We're tailgating and bowling. Easy enough, right? Uh, so come on out and have some fun with us. And then Saturday, whoo, man. Yes, Saturday, 
We got the women. She is happening. That's at 10 a.m. Saturday at 10 a.m. The she is happening. Please RSVP to the evite that was sent to you. If you didn't get an evite, go see Diana in the lobby today afterwards. She will send it to you on the spot. Capiche? Capiche. Awesome. Who says capiche anymore? Okay. Sunday, so that's, oh my gosh, we got Wednesday is what? Life groups. Thursday is youth group. Friday is watchmen. Saturday is she. Sunday, we're having water baptisms at church. That's right. People dedicating their life for the first time or maybe rededicating their life to Jesus. It's an amazing thing. You don't want to miss that. Please come back out next Sunday to experience the water baptisms that were going to happen. It's going to be a great time out in the parking lot again. People are getting saved, and who doesn't love that, right? All right, perfect. And then on the last Sunday of this month, the youth group is having a fundraiser after church. We're doing another fundraiser. It is strictly for summer camp, okay? We're doing a lunch fundraiser after service. Everything that we make that day is going towards the students going to summer camp, and we're having special guests come to help us out that day. We're going to have some special giveaways as well and some merch that can be sold to all the donations going towards the students going to summer camp. So please come out, mark it in your calendar the last Sunday of this month. It's going to be great. Awesome. All right. Tithes and offerings now. Now let's move on to our tithes and our offerings. Uh, this is the part where we worship. We worship with song. We worship with communion. We get to worship with our tithes and with our offerings. And Miss Terry said it today that we need him, right? If we're going through a battle, we need him. So let's stop trying to do this world, this life on our own. Let's stop trying to do our finances on our own. Let's just trust God with everything that we have. And we believe here that we give a tenth part back to him. That's 10% of what he gives us already. And we are left to live with the 90% because God's blessed us with so much. Amen. And he will keep on providing for us. And uh, all we have to do is just trust in him and, and let him know that, that we trust with everything that we have. So let's go ahead and do that. A few ways that you can do that is the envelopes and the seat back pockets. Put your cash or checks in there. Please make checks out to Grand Central Collective. You can scan the QR code that's on the seat back pockets as well. That will take you to a website to give. If you like Tithely, you can use that as well. It's an app or a website. Go ahead and go there. Make sure you choose Grand Central Collective as your church of giving. And if you're watching at home or for those of you that want to go back home later, go to our website, www.grandcentralcollective.com, and there's a green give button that you can give. It will make it super easy for you guys. And if you have envelopes, you can drop those in the buckets on the side. Or if you just have cash, drop it in the buckets on the side. It's all gravy. Cool? Awesome. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, thank you for this Sunday, this beautiful, rainy California Sunday, Lord. I pray that you will continue to work and move inside this auditorium, continue to work and move in the homes of all who are watching. And I pray that you would continue to speak to us as pastor comes up here. Bless this offering. Bless the tithes that come in, Lord. Let us reach every ear in the Santa Clarita area, in Canaan Country, in Saugus, in New Hall, all the places up here, Lord. Everyone that needs to hear your good news, I pray that this offering gets us a little bit closer to that goal, God. We love you, and we thank you, and we, we pray that you bless this offering. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you as you give. Central. Man, I am so excited. Why are you so Because you came to church today. And I know that the rain is out there and all of that, but it wasn't going to stop you, and I'm glad it didn't stop you. And um, we're going to jump into um, what actually is our second message in our series. Um, we started, we've had a long, we've had a great run over the last several weeks. We had um, Palm Sunday and our kids rocked it, did a tremendous job singing their song. Hosanna, Hosanna, it was amazing. And then we, we had Easter celebrating the resurrection of Christ. 
Here's the deal with that. We celebrate his resurrection every single day. We don't have to wait till next Easter for us to get amped up again. We ought to be amped up every single day because that resurrection power brings with it life-giving, transformational stuff for our lives, as Terry was talking about earlier during worship. And so when we come into his house, we can be excited, we can worship the Lord. When we leave his house, we can be excited, we can worship the Lord. He is good each and every day, amen, each and every day. And then followed that up with in and out last week. And it wasn't just about in and out, but another great crowd in the house and so many new friends. And God's doing something here. And um, I was like, Lord, don't let it stop. Let's just keep on rolling. And you all came out this morning, and I am very appreciative of that. Um, there's a special place in heaven for those that come out two weeks after Easter. Special, special place in heaven. So give yourselves a hand for being here this morning. We're so excited to see what God has for us today. <clears throat> Is that all you love yourself? That was like somebody just barely missed a putt on the 18th green. That was just the worst golf clap I've ever. I said, give yourself a hand because you are important. You are special. You are good. So we're going to talk about <clears throat> letting go today. And um, jumping back into that, I want to talk about letting go, control of our lives, and having a surrendered life. Everybody say surrendered. surrendered. Say it like you mean it, surrendered. surrendered. Boom, surrendered. Now, it's easy to say, but let me just tell you something, very difficult to do. To 100%, Lord, I give myself to you, I surrender myself to you. To you, you would think that if you said those words and if you meant them in your heart and you were desperately trying to just run after God each and every day, that it would get easier and easier. I will tell you it gets better and better, but it is still waking up every day surrendering to him. Waking up every day saying, Lord, I am yours. Lord, here I am. Take my life. Take all of me. So when we talk about living a surrendered life in Christ, it seems like this ought to be the only real thing that matters as a Christ follower. Do you know that there's so many things that can keep us away from fully surrendering? So many things that can keep us away from fully giving ourselves to him. We're going to try to carve those things out today. Some people say, well, I'm, I, you know, I'm living, I'm doing all the right stuff. We get caught up so many times in doing things. You know, how many, how many are doers? In, and I know we're supposed to be doers of the word, yes. But we get so caught up in doing all the right things that it has us motivated. It has us doing all the work. And somewhere in the mix of that, we need to understand that without God, without Christ as center, we're not going to experience his perfect will in our lives. We're not going to experience his perfect will that matters in our lives. And so when we get to the end of this, whatever this is, when you get to the end of your years, the end of your days, some things that won't matter are these. It won't matter how much money you have. It won't matter how much money you have. So I say you might as well just give it all to the Lord now. Yeah, some of you are going to I'm going to pray about that, Pastor. I'm going to go home and pray about that. It won't matter how popular you are. It won't matter how many nice things people say about you. It really won't matter about this. It won't matter how many Girl Scout cookies you buy. Some of you are suckers for those sweet little gals at the exit of your Ralph store, your Vaughn store, and they're just saying, please, sir, would you buy? And, and boom, you just buy. But it's not going to matter. You, you did a good work, yes, but that won't matter. It won't matter how many hungry people that you fed. It won't matter how many wonderful things you did. It won't matter how, how much money you give to the church. It won't matter how many missionaries you support. It won't matter how many times that you're here during the course of a week or how many hours that you spend at church during the course of a month. Those things won't matter. And it won't matter how many elderly ladies that you helped walk across the street. 
I know, and that's a big one, and it seems like that's so amazing, and that should count for something. But I want to encourage you today that we can do a lot of these things, and certainly everything that I mentioned right there would be important to do, would be nice to do, would be something that you might consider to do, but it would just be that, you doing a lot of stuff. You doing a lot of stuff. I want to, I want to encourage you in something today. Quit doing Quit doing. We are not trying to catch the, the God to, to kind of glance in our direction. We're not trying to get his attention. Like if I, just, if I just do better, if I just do more, if I just give more, if I just go and serve more, then I'm going to really be at a place where God is going to notice me. How many know that God knows you? He knows who you are. He knows you already. He knows everything about you. God knows you. So you can't do anything that's going to get his attention and make him love you anymore. God loves you just the way you are. God loves you. Now he wants you to change. He wants transformation. We're going to get to that. But God loves you, period. He loves you, period. God loves you, period. God loves you regardless. God loves you even though... You messed up yesterday. God loves you even though he really spoke to your heart when that special offering was going to be taken and said X amount is what you should do. And you went less, you went low. He went high, you went low. God still loves you. It is not over. It's not finished. And so, But I want to try to lay something out today that will keep us from jumping into the trap of doing so that God will love us. Doing so that God will love us more. And it has to do with just this one thing, living a surrendered life. A life that is totally sold out, totally given to, totally not held on to by yourself, not holding on closer, not holding on tighter, but allowing yourself to be given away to the Lord. I read a lot of uh, different things this week. I was going through different remedies and people's, um, you know, short stories and short sermons, and I was just kind of looking here, looking there. Do you know I could find a lot of stuff that had to do with a person doing three things in order to have a surrendered life? Do these three things, three steps to a surrendered life, three things that we could do to surrender our lives better to the Lord. Things like, you know, maybe you witness more. If you witness more, then then, then you're going you're gonna to go up in stature in terms of who you are in Christ because now you're, you're going from somebody that's, that's quiet like a church mouse to somebody that's telling everybody you meet about Jesus. So if we could just do that a little bit better, just tell a few more people this week about Christ. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but if we could do that, then we would arrive at this place of being surrendered to Christ. Sounds reasonable. Sounds like it should be okay. Maybe I was reading some other things that said we just need to pray more. Pray more, pray more, pray more. You just need to pray more. If, you, if, if you're not surrendered to the Lord, pray more. Just pray more. Now, and I know you're going to agree with all these things, but it's going to all kind of come full circle here in a minute. Read my Bible more. Three steps to totally being surrendered to the Lord is to Read my Bible, one of them. Read my Bible more. I've got to get into the Word more. Go to church more. If I can just get to church more, I'm going to break last year's record, and I'm going to go three times. I'm going to get there more. If we could just get to that point of more, then I will, at least from, from the outside, maybe people looking at me say, oh, wow, Daryl, he's pretty surrendered. He's pretty committed. Maybe it's just I, I just need to fellowship more. I need to get out there, I need to bust out of my norms, and I need to fellowship more, get to know the folks in the church, get to know the folks outside the church, maybe visit some other folks in other church. I, I just gotta, I gotta mingle more. I gotta get out there. Maybe you think, well, I just gotta speak in tongues more. Just speak in tongues. If you're, if you're a, a, a tongue talker, if you're like, you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is yours, then maybe I just need to talk more in tongues. 
Let me just talk more. Let me just get in my prayer closet. Let me just shut that door behind me and get in there and, and just go, just me and God and just my heavenly language. And I'm not making light of it, but I'm just simply saying maybe we just say, if I just get more of that, then it would show that I am really, really surrendered to the Lord. That would be my MO, my, my modus uh, operandi, my modus, uh, my mode of operation. It would be the, how people look at me and say, oh, that's just how, that's how Pastor rolls. That's, how, that's what he does. That's who he is. So amazing. So we can look at things like that. So if I just do that or if I just give of myself more. I just need to be more available. And if anybody calls me, I need to say yes. Middle of the night, yes. I have other responsibilities. Doesn't matter, yes. And we just go. And if we just throw ourselves into that, sometimes we get caught up into that. If I just throw myself into it more, then it's going to be better. And people will look at me and go, wow. Daryl is just so surrendered. And sometimes we will even fall into the trap that we feel more surrendered because we're doing more of the things that look like a surrendered life. And you say, wow, pastor, where are you going? Are you down on these things? No, not at all. So before anybody kind of binds me up and casts me out and throws me out into the street as a heretic... <laughs> I just want to encourage you that all of those things are amazing. All of those things are wonderful. All of those things are necessary. All of those things that, that, that you can do in your life are going to encourage you, going to grow you, going to help you, going to cause you to mature in your spiritual life and a spiritual being as a Christ follower. But they are wrapped up in this one thing, if it's not done out of the purity of heart, wrapped up into this one thing, and that is that we are going to do enough so that God says, you are totally surrendered to me. I see it because you're doing everything right. And sometimes we can get caught up in all of the doing that we forget to allow God to do the doing. We find ourselves continually, because we're, we're built this way, and then we run in this rat race that says we have to be successful, run in this rat race that says we have to get to the next level, run in this rat race that says I want the corner office, run in this rat race that says if I can just make this amount of money, then I will call myself surrendered and successful in this thing that I'm chasing. If I could just do more, you following me so far? If I could just do more, then I would be looked at among my peers and everybody else in the church as a successful, surrendered man of God. Now, who doesn't want that title? I think that's a compliment. If somebody were to say that you are a, a successful, surrendered man of God, a su successful, surrendered woman of God, then, wow, praise the Lord, I take that to myself, and with humility, I accept that. But we're built in a way, and we're thrown into the society that says if you just go and do more, then you'll be more amazing. You'll be more of what the people want. And so I want to encourage you to be not, not chasing, not, not steps toward a surrendered life. I'm not going to give you those today. But I'm going to give you something that is even further than that, and that is marked by a surrendered life. Being marked by a surrendered life as if the hand of God would, would penetrate through the clouds on a day like today and come in and burst on the scene when there's no sun and be marked by a hand that comes all the way through the clouds, puts his thumbprint on you. Being marked by God is better than doing for God. Follow me. Work with me, people. Being marked by God, the hand of God touching my life far more superior than me trying to do a bunch of stuff for God. And so I'm going to encourage you today in your surrendering, understand it's not found in how many things that you do for Jesus. It is found in you allowing yourself to be humbled so that the hand of God can come out of the heavenlies and touch your life. That people would look at you and say, surely and clearly there is a mark of God on their lives. You can see it in them. You can see it in the, how they talk. You can see it in how they pray for one another. You can see it. There is something special there. They're marked by God. So my question for you today is to right off the top, 
Ask the question. Ask yourself. I'm not going to make you ask your neighbor today. Ask yourself, though, am I marked by God? Is my life marked by him? Or is it marked by a bunch of things that I do? And the reason I want to identify again the marks of a surrendered life versus the steps toward a surrendered life is to show the parallels between man-made self-effort, which are the steps toward, Versus God doing and divine effect, which is the mark of God on your life. So you can do things, man-made. You can do things in the, the course of your week. As you, you can think it out. You can rationalize. You can put together a legitimate plan. You can do all those things. Or... You can allow yourself to be marked by the hand of a loving God. Let him mark your life today. Three things that I want to give you today. Let there be, number one, a willingness to surrender to God. A willingness to surrender to God. Secondly, renewed thinking in God. And thirdly, servant ministry for God. I want you to take home this, that there is a transformation. When the, when the hand of God touches you, you're transformed. Come on, somebody. When the hand of God touches your life, you are transformed. You get the word. I've preached about this many times in the past. Metamorphosis, metamorpho. And in that metamorpho, the original language in the Greek, in that transformation of the master, it's a work that is taking place in you. It transfigures. It's to take who you are and transform you into another thing altogether. And I tell you, in order to go through that radical transformation, it can be very painful. How many know that? It can be very painful, so be careful what you pray. Lord, make me like you. When we jump out there and we say, Lord, make me like you, then we are taking on the prayer of the centuries. We are taking on something that is beyond what our lips are saying, beyond what our mind can comprehend. When we say, Lord, make me like you, I want to be like you, Jesus. You are, now that is a sincere prayer and it comes from a good place in our hearts. But let me understand something with you all today. That when we pray that kind of prayer, we can expect something in that moment then to transform and our lives to be changed. And when we don't see that kind of production happening in our lives with the transformation, then let me tell you something. The things that can come along are going to press us. When transformation happens, it presses us. Anybody ever been pressed by the Holy Spirit? You've been praying? That's why it says, like, when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit prays, and, they, and he prays with great groanings. There is that pressing, there is that, that transformative, there's that metamorpho that takes place in each one of us, and it is a painful thing. Painful thing to go through. So when we pray, Lord, make me like you, again, good prayer, but that requires each and every one of us to pay a price. How many would agree with me? Hello? We are in church, we're all together here. So when we pray, Lord, make me like you, that is a prayer that's saying, Lord, I am not like you. I am nothing like you. I am not even being close to you, Lord, in terms of who you are and who I am. And I am desperately praying, Lord, I want to be like you. Jesus, I want to reflect your life in a world that has gone crazy. I want people to see you in me. And when we pray that prayer, we need to be ready because if God is going to do that in us, it is going to be painful. But it's a great prayer at the altar. I'm not making fun of anybody's altar experience. It's a great prayer here. I prayed it before, Lord, whatever it takes, whatever you want to do in my life, make me like you, Lord. And it will usually come with a heavy price. So I ask you today, if you're not like Christ completely, with I don't think anybody in the house is, right? We're not all like him. We're not all there. But if that is your prayer today and you really desire that, then I want to encourage you in something. Buckle up. 
hold on, continue to stay close to him because he will keep his promise to you. He will answer your prayer. How many believe in a God that answers prayer? He will answer that prayer. And if your desire is to be like Christ, then buckle up because he's going to transform you. He's going to mess with you. Not to be mean. But God is not interested in us building our own kingdoms. God is interested in building our character. He's more interested in building the character than he is interested in building our personal kingdoms. I'm not interested in trying to be the biggest, the baddest, and the best. I just want to be a servant of God. And for him to metamorpho in me, for that transformation, that transfiguration to happen, it will be painful because I'm not close to being who he is. And so we need to go through this process. Allow the metamorphosis to take place in you. Galatians 4 and 19 says, My little children, through whom I, I am again in the pains of labor, until Christ is completely and permanently formed within you. Paul is talking to the Christians and the church in Galatia. And in the process of that, continually in pain for them, continually in prayer for them, continually um, uh, interceding for them and standing in the gap for them. And it talks about this being, the, the, the Christ being completely and permanently formed within them. That word formed in that, in that context means this, that which is shaped through the adjustment of parts. So if we are going to become like him today, and if we are going to be formed in his likeness and in his image, which we've been made in that, then understand he's going to mess with you. He is going to move things around have you ever been playing Scrabble when there was a little toddler in the room? And you got all your letters matched up there, and you got all your letters, you're trying to get the words, and you're all into it, and then, and then a little one comes through, and boom, chaos happens, and stuff is scattered. And it's kind of like that, and that God is going to take that which we are used to, that which is normal, that which is our routine, and he is going to come right down in the middle of it, and he's going to scatter it, not to frustrate you, but to build you. Not to get you angry at him, but to get you looking up to him. And in the process of that, he will change your life. Number one today, marked by surrender to God. Marked by surrender to God. Romans 12 and 1 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart, as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. Being marked by surrender, friends, is to understand more clearly his mercy toward us. If we want our lives to be marked by surrender to God, then we must get a firm, more firm of a grasp on his mercy toward us. Is his mercy and is his grace meaningful in your life? Is his mercy and his grace meaningful in your life? See, that's the moment where if we think about it long enough, without his grace, I'm nothing. Without his mercy, I am nothing. Without grace, I am not going to heaven. Without that mercy on my life, I cannot embrace that sanctification process that he wants to engage with me on a daily basis, I have got to know his mercy. I have got to know that the God that is holy, that, that doesn't tolerate sin, I've got to know how precious that is that he would come and invade my life and want to put his print on me. And in him putting his print on me, the transformation, that power that I talked about, in that moment, we discover how real, how powerful, how engaging is this mercy of a loving God that doesn't have to accept me, but he does, doesn't have to bless me, but he does, doesn't have to pour into my life, but he does. So to understand his mercy is to understand surrender. 
Because when mercy is there and applied to our lives, then we find out, each and every one of us, that we can, in that moment, surrender to him gladly, willingly, 100% given to him. Without an understanding of mercy, we don't value. Come on, somebody. We don't value what he has accomplished on the cross. We don't value the power of the resurrection. We don't value his sinless life. We don't value the scourging hall. We don't value the trial that took place at night. We don't value the resurrection in the empty tomb without understanding the mercy. We cannot value, and therefore we, not, we, we see our lives as not fully surrendered. But when we understand who he is, when we understand what he's done, when we understand what he has for us, then it's a new ball game, right? Then it's a good thing. Then we say, wow, God, I am so appreciative of what you've done. I am so excited what you've done in my life. I am so grateful, God, because you know I am a sinner saved by grace. A sinner saved by grace. So understanding that is to have our lives marked by surrender to God. 1 John 4 and 19 says, we love. See, again, God comes after us. I know we, we accept him. I know we receive him. I know that many of us have prayed what is called a sinner's prayer. But God is continually chasing us. Come on, somebody. God is continually coming after us as stated in 1 John 4, 19. We love, why? Because he loved us first. We love because God has shown his mercy when we were not, when we were not loving, when we were not lovable. Have you ever tried to love somebody that kept slapping your hand? You ever try to reach to somebody that kept saying, no, no, thank you? You ever reach out to somebody that didn't appreciate what you did? Anybody in the house or is it just me? So we find ourselves stuck up against this thing here. When we understand the goodness of God that he has chased me, it is easier for me to chase him. When I understand the mercy and the magnitude of his grace has been extended and afforded to me, then it is easier for me then to respond to that, which is full surrender, because I understand the full price that was paid for me. When we don't understand nor value, then it just seems like a verse that we read. Oh, we love because he first loved us. And it feels good, it's nice, it's cheery. We can leave the church, we can talk about it at lunch in a few. And we say, man, it's so good, I love Jesus because he first loved me. <laughs> but we've got to go deeper and further to understand when we weren't lovable, he still loved us. When we weren't lovable, God still loved us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. I'm not lovable. God loves me. I'm surrendered to him. His fingerprint on my life. Romans 5 and 8 says, but God clearly shows and proves his love for us, his own love for us, by the fact that while we were sinners... While we were still lost in our sin, us in control of our lives, not God, not giving him leadership, while we were still in the muck of sin and going our way that we thought was the perfect way and it was not close, while we were in that condition of our lives in sin, Christ died for us. In that place, we have redemption. To understand that redemption in the middle of my sin is to cause me to say, God, I surrender to you 100%. When I understand his mercy and price paid and his love for me and his affection for me, I can surrender to him. When we understand the magnitude of his mercy, we, be, we begin to bear the mark of full surrender. You should write that down. When we, when we understand the magnitude of his mercy, we began to bear the mark of full surrender. Understanding the magnitude, your life bears the mark. Matthew 20, 20, 28 says this, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve... 
Christ did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, paying the price to set them free from the penalty of sin. Pretty special, isn't it? Pretty special, isn't it? I mean, wow! While I'm a sinner, he died. I'm chasing him, but God chased me first. Now scripture's telling us that he has paid the price to set us free from the penalty of sin. Because the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is, the wages of sin is, the wages of sin is death. But grace. The wages of sin is death. But mercy. The wages of sin is death. But while I was a sinner, he died for me. Love. The wages of sin is death. But he still chases me every day. Some would say, what a loser God. Why would he want to chase around a bunch of people that are just simply lost in their sin? Because he has this love affair with us. And he doesn't want to let us go. Aren't you glad that he doesn't want to let you go? Aren't you glad that you are in his mind constantly? Aren't you glad that the love of God penetrates your life on a daily basis? Secondly, marked by renewal in God. Romans 12 and 2 says this, And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs. Anybody say amen to that? (laughs) Superficial, man. Look around in our world. What is real anymore? What is real anymore? I love coming to church because even though the world is crazy, when I come to church, this is about as real as I can get on this side of heaven. A bunch of people that love Jesus with all their heart or those that are seeking after him, those that are checking it out, those that are popping in for a visit because they heard the music. Church, our experience here, that's why it's so meaningful what Michelle shared during communion. When we come into this place, it's not about division. It's not about who said what, he said, she said. It is about unity as the body of Christ. This is as real as it gets, this side of heaven. But be transformed and progressively changed. You are not going to be like Jesus overnight. And if you have made it and that is you and you're amazing, please talk to me. Because I want to know how you did it in such short order. Now, I've known people that have been addicted to, 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 to cocaine, to cigarettes, to alcohol, and they gave their lives to Christ and boom, the next day. God transformed them. No, no longer drinking. I know Charles' story. Sometime ask him. The whole idea is, is that there's a lot of stories like that in the house today. His mercy, his grace transformed. But when we go on this journey with him, it is day in and day out becoming more and more like Christ. It doesn't happen overnight. By the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values, ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, perfect in his plan and purpose for you. A transformed life, friends, is marked by thinking, thinking, thinking that is being continually transformed and renewed. Your mind needs to be renewed. When you go out in this world all six days of it before you get back here again, doesn't mean that you can't live it out there. I'm just simply saying six days, six days with, without corporate fellowship and worship can be a drain on you, right? And so when we come together, it's super duper important for us, but a transformed life marked by our minds continually being renewed in God. So many people today are carbon copies of imperfection. Everybody wants to be like so-and-so. Everybody, even in the Christian world. Everybody, you know what? When, when celebrities give their hearts to Christ, you know what I say to the church? Leave them alone. You know why I say that? 
because the church gets in there and tries to make them like the church. No, don't let them be carbon copies of our imperfection. Let Jesus take them and transform them and do a work in them. I remember when Kat Von D went public with her transformation. She got baptized. It was all over the internet. And guess who the biggest supporters of her transformation were? All of those people that were in the darkness with her. Amazing. She has found something that's doing something in her heart that she loves. But the biggest haters were people in the church. Drives me bonkers. We pray for people and then they come to Christ and then we get mad at them because they're not instantly transformed. Hello, come on somebody. Shame the devil, tell the truth. So what we do sometimes in the Christian world is we take people, let them grow, let them get close to Jesus, let them be transformed, let them experience something. I remember back when a prominent baseball player gave his heart to Christ. He was... Always in the paper, always written up, always being suspended. Had a coke problem, snorting everything that he could find, and it wasn't pretty. He got saved, and all of a sudden, the church stepped in, lifted him on a platform, elevated it to this super demagogue, and demigod, and then all of a sudden, they looked to him and said, "Oh boy, you're you're going to point us to the to the to the Christ. You're going to you're going to take us home now. This is going to be great." He got up there on that platform that we all pushed him to, and then he fell six months later deeper than he was before. Let people grow. In the process of that, I'm thinking, get back to my notes here, that that, people are being transformed in carbon copies. When I say that, it's like, I I, I wanna be like Paul, to say follow me as I follow Christ, but I'm very careful to say, hey, be exactly like me because I'm one cool dude. That is very, very difficult. That is very, should not be in our vocabulary. Scripture tells us to not be fashioned after the world. Come on, somebody. He said, no, don't be fashioned after the world, but be morphed or metamorpho into an original. God made you an original. Your fingerprint is your fingerprint. I oftentimes look at my forefinger and then my pointer finger and my thumb on my left hand. My thumb on my left hand, when I was in middle school, I was on a table saw. We're getting ready to go camping, and, and I went right through the blade, almost cut my finger off, and it bears the marks of it. It was barely hanging, crank, crank, like a screen door. And the right one is when I was on the playground in first grade, and I threw a piece of glass. Maybe you remember the story, because I was trying to impress Trudy Ann, and it busted right through. And so I have two fingerprints that nobody can copy, but well before I destroyed them, God had already given me an original that nobody else has. Nobody else is like me. Nobody else has fingerprints like this. You're an original. Don't be a carbon copy of somebody else. Our world is crazy. Social media full of wannabe influencers. Come on, hello. Man, these influencers are so full of themselves that they live off of the people that they're trying to fashion more like them. Buy this makeup, wear these clothes, come on. Get this hairstyle, I can't do that one. Get this hairstyle, drive this car, purchase this jewelry, pursue this style, be like me. Jesus was the original influencer who said, if you want to be like me, do this. Matthew 16, 24 and 26 says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to follow me, you want to be like me? Again, the prayer we prayed at the altar, as my disciple, he must what? Deny himself, set aside selfish interests, and take up his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come, and follow me. Believe in me, the Amplified says, conforming to my example in living, and if need be, suffering, perhaps dying because of faith in me. For whoever wishes to save his life in this world will eventually lose it, through death, but whoever loses his life in this world for my sake will find it that is life with me for all eternity. 
For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, wealth, fame, success, but forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Somebody tell me this morning that that didn't just hit in your life. When I say, Lord, make me like you. I want to be yours, Jesus. I'm your man. I'm your woman. I'm, boy, I'm, I'm the person. I mean, I'm his man. If you're a woman, you're his woman. Just want to be clear. But the whole idea is this, that if we pray those prayers, we want to be that. God takes us serious. And he says, man, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. In the, more, in the world, you're going to be marked because you carry this banner. In the world, they're not going to speak too highly of you. In the world, they're going to let satanic groups on campus, but not a Christian group on campus. In the world, they're going to let a transgender thing on campus, but not, but not a, a Christian club on campus. In the world, you are going to have tribulation. But church, this is the joy of Scripture. But be of good cheer, because I, him, Jesus, God of the universe and the angels, armies has overcome this world hallelujah hallelujah Woo! he's saying you want to conform don't conform to the brokenness of the world don't be a carbon copy fashioned after somebody that is broken be a carbon copy conform according to jesus um, be conformed to his example of life which is going to do this cause you pain that builds character. Be like Jesus. If your thinking is marked by God, then you're moving toward that surrendered life. Can you see him all over your mind? Can you, can you see him in the things that you see, how you see, how you think, how you react? He's wanting to build character, not kingdoms. He's wanted to, and that doesn't mean he's not going to bless you. It doesn't mean that your bank account isn't going to be greater than the person you're sitting next to. You guys battle it out however great you want him to be. But I'm just simply saying, <laughs> pretty, pretty great. <laughs> want it to be great. Pastor, hey, I'm with you, man. I'm in your camp. Just remember when you get there that Jesus blessed you and the tithe belongs in the house. Marked by ministry for God, in Romans 12, 3 through 8 says this, For by the grace of God given to me, I say to every one of you, or every one of you, not to think more highly of himself and of his importance and ability than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. As God has appointed to each a degree of faith and a purpose designed for service, he is calling us to serve him, service to him, ministry to him, for God, for just as in one physical body we have many parts, and these parts do not all have the same function or special use, so we who are many are nevertheless just one body in Christ, and individually we are parts of one another, mutually dependent on each other. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to use them accordingly. If someone has a gift of prophecy, let him speak a new message from God to his people in proportion to the faith that he possesses. If it is service in the act of serving, or he who teaches in the act of teaching, or he who encourages in the act of encouragement, he who gives with generosity, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy in caring for others, let it be done with cheerfulness. Ministry for God, as demonstrated here in those five verses, is putting my faith into action. I close with this thought. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, was once asked to disclose his secret. Anybody know the Salvation Army? Anybody ever take a bag of clothes and drop it off there? You took some, some furniture, okay? So you know William Booth is the founder of that organization. And he was once asked to disclose his secret for success. He hesitated I want you to capture this. He hesitated a second, and then tears began to form in his eyes and roll down his cheeks. And then he said, I will tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. 
There have been men with greater brains than I. How many would say amen? Men with greater opportunities. But from the day that I got the poor of London on my heart and a vision of Jesus Christ and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with the poor of London, that's where he started, I made up my mind, here it is, I made up my mind that he would have all of William Booth that there was. And if there is anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it is because it is because he has all the adoration of my heart, all of the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. He has everything that I am. I want you to stand with me, church. He has everything that I am. The greatness of a man's power is found in the magnitude of his surrender. Keep that here. The greatness of a man's power is found in the magnitude of his surrender. Show me a man fully surrendered to God, I'll show you a powerful man. Show me a woman that, that loves God more than anything else in this life, I will show you a powerful woman. The greatness of a man's power is found in the magnitude of his surrender. It's not about doing for Christ, but instead responding to Christ because of what he has already done. Somebody shout if God has been good to you. Yeah. Has he been good to you? Yeah. If he has been good to you, and he has, and he pours into your life on a daily basis, and he does, then you're a powerful person. The magnitude of your surrender now in reflection to what God has done or in response, better yet, to what God has done in your life makes you powerful. Not your position, not your authority, not what people think of you. What makes you powerful is your surrender and the magnitude of your surrender to God. We serve a good God today. It's not about doing for Christ. It's not about doing for Christ, but instead responding to Christ because of what he has already done. His redeeming work on the cross is enough. His agonizing in the scourging hall is enough. His word is enough. His peace that passes all understanding is enough. His joy unspeakable and full of glory is enough. His grace is enough. His mercy is enough. His love is enough. His forgiveness is enough. His power, love, and a sound mind is enough. His death once for all is enough. His hope is enough. His salvation is enough. And when we hear his well done good and faithful servant, it will also be enough. So we serve a God today that is more than enough. Loves us with all of his heart. Gave everything to us. Show me a strong man and I will show you somebody fully surrendered to a good God. God loves you. We're going to close out today, not in a solemn way, not in an at the altar way, but in a way that expresses what we started with at the top and the onset of this service, that God is good. Lord, you are good, and your mercy endureth forever. Are you ready? Let's worship. Let's celebrate the goodness of God. Hallelujah.
is good. Church, I want you to take that out with you today. God is good. One more time. God is good. Friends, if you're strong in Christ today, it's because your life surrendered to him. Continue to walk in that. See you out in the lobby. God bless you. Have an amazing Sunday in Jesus.